The Democracy Forum is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2009 under the patronage of Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne. Its principal goal was to work for the furtherance of democracy, peace and the rule of law in order to counter religious fundamentalism and intolerance in our global communities. In an increasingly fractured world, this goal continues to be the driving force behind all of the Forum's activities. Lord Charles Bruce is the current president of the Forum. Since its inception, the Forum has hosted and co-hosted seminars on a wide variety of topics relating to democracy and human rights across the world. The Democracy Forum encourages academics, students, journalists and other socially and politically conscious people to attend our seminars and to participate in the question and answer session. Details are available on our website, thedemocracyforumlimited.com. The Democracy Forum presents a live interactive discussion on Who will govern Afghanistan? Impending U.S. withdrawal and the unfolding crisis After almost 20 years of war, what will be the implications for Afghanistan of a complete American and NATO withdrawal? Will there be chaos? Will there be a proxy war? Will it be advantageous to China in the new great game? How likely is cooperation between the Taliban and the Kabul government in bringing peace to this conflict-torn nation? And, in a future where the Taliban may reassert themselves as a ruling force, what are the prospects for Afghanistan's women and minorities? Chaired by Humphrey Hawksley. Panelists include Hussein Haqqani, Dr. Dartwood Azami, Afrasi of Katak, Dr. Antonio Giustosi, Tim Foxley. Good afternoon, good morning if you're in North America, good late afternoon and evening through the Middle East and into Asia. Uh, my name is Humphrey Hawksley. I'm moderating this very important discussion on the future of Afghanistan. And before I go into the details about the panelists and the format that we're going to have, I'd like to give the screen to Lord Charles Bruce, the president of Democracy Forum, to give us an overview of what we'll be debating today. Welcome to the Democracy Forum, which this afternoon is hosting a webinar, Who Will Govern Afghanistan? Our forum, together with its sister publication, Asian Affairs Magazine, has been following the politics of Central and South Asia for many years. Our July edition focuses on the challenge that faces the United States as it prepares to leave Afghanistan after 20 years of combat operations. And it fires a warning shot for anyone who thinks this will be a straightforward process. Afghanistan is a bloody battleground of rivalry between different players, global, regional and domestic. It remains one of the most dangerous places on earth. Five months ago, on February the 29th, the United States agreed a time frame with Taliban negotiators for total military withdrawal. For many Afghan people, this peace initiative can't happen quickly enough. Around 3,500 civilians have been collateral casualties of war each year since 2001. For the United States, the war has cost almost a trillion dollars and taken the lives of 2,500 soldiers. So, to end the longest war they've ever fought, the Americans have agreed to a total de-escalation of all military operations and it's planned that within 14 months, 13,000 military personnel will have been repatriated. But the question remains, is this a peace agreement or is the United States simply arranging the terms of its withdrawal? Will this be perceived as a surrender? Although the deal envisages the start of intra-Afghan talks and the cessation of violence, the Taliban, however, have been obligated to very little that can be measured in any meaningful sense. There is also some doubt that the United States will actually implement full troop withdrawal for fear of leaving a vacuum. It is more than faintly ironical that President Trump accused his presidential rival Hillary Clinton of a precipitous withdrawal of troops from Iraq in 2011. She gave us ISIS, he claimed. In the 19th century, the British learned that Afghanistan should never be left alone. Having concluded a treaty in Kabul in 1894, 
The Viceroy Lord Lansdowne summarised his policy in Central Asia. If one thing is certain, he wrote, any space left vacant upon our Indian frontier will be filled by others if we do not step in ourselves. It is the prospect of forming a vacuum that is driving speculation about the future governance of Afghanistan. It's not certain that without threat of American deterrence, the Taliban can be trusted to prevent al-Qaeda and the Islamic State from operating at large. Uncertainty also remains over the destiny of the fledgling democratic state. The Taliban have published a draft charter for forming an Islamic emirate, which threatens to reverse many advancements in human rights granted by the current Afghan constitution. Deputy Head of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, Mohammed Naim Nazari, claims the charter is clearly contradicting the values of democracy and human rights. Afghanistan's political geography opens its nascent state to external interference by at least five countries and their proxies. Iran, Russia, China, Pakistan and India. While Iran is working to improve its ties with the Taliban, India and Pakistan will seek to counter each other's influence. Although it withdrew its forces in 1988, Russia is already playing a part in the peace process with a view to extending its influence. China is Afghanistan's largest source of foreign investment and the biggest investor in Afghan infrastructure. Several commentators suggest that Beijing has hedged itself against most eventualities likely to emerge from American withdrawal. It has laid its groundwork and is in a far more comfortable position to weather any chaos that might follow. The predicament that confronts the Afghan people is of profound concern to us at the Democracy Forum. Their homeland is faced by a unique set of challenges that reflect and reinforce the circumstances of its historical geography. I hope that this webinar today will encourage and stimulate further debate about the future of this proud and resilient country. We're very grateful to all our speakers who have agreed to join the panel today. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Lord Bruce, for a very thoughtful introduction. And as I was listening to that, and as I've been looking through some of the uh, cuttings on uh, Afghanistan lately, uh, I've been reminded of a film I watched when I was a child. It was called Dr. Shivago. And some of you may remember it or know it, but there was a scene when Dr. Shivago had uh, escaped from the militia that were holding him, the, the red militia that were holding him. And he was going through this dreadful snowy wasteland of a landscape and came across a mother with, I think, two children going in the opposite direction. And she says to him, barely able to speak, soldiers, soldiers. And he says, which soldiers, red or white? And she says, looking at him glazed, soldiers, soldiers. And whenever I read about or have seen a village that's been struck, a maternity hospital, an intelligence center, a Sikh temple in the 20 odd years of Afghanistan war, I often think of that, is that when you're the person in Afghanistan just trying to get on with your life and somebody comes and then we, the press, say, well, it was the Taliban or it was Al-Qaeda or it was the Americans or it was the Russians or whatever, for them it's just soldiers, soldiers. So what we're trying to do now is, is dig a little bit deeper into that as to what might happen in the future with the proposed American troop withdrawal. And we have actually a stunning range of experts with this. There's a slight change to the program. It is as if Leek couldn't make it and is withdrawn. And we're lucky enough to have Dr. Darwood Azami as an associate fellow of the South Asia program at the International Institute of Strategic Studies uh, and a multimedia editor at BBC World Service. I'm gonna ask Dr. Azami to, 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 to start the flow of this to give us an idea of the changing regional dynamics and their impact on war and peace in Afghanistan. So, Dr. Azami, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Humphrey, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And thank you to Lord Bruce and the Democracy Forum for 
inviting me to this uh, timely discussion. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, three countries, India, Russia, and Iran, supported the anti-Taliban alliance in Afghanistan. Now two of them, Iran and Russia, have close contacts with the Taliban, and Pakistan had already been blamed for supporting the Taliban. So several Afghan and U.S. officials have also accused Iran and Russia of supporting the Taliban, a charge all three of them usually deny. India is the only major regional player which doesn't have formal contacts with the Taliban. On the other hand, three countries, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, had recognized the Taliban regime in Afghanistan in the 1990s. Today, however, the Afghan government is a supporter of Saudi Arabia and the UAE and vice versa. President Ghani spoke strongly in support of the Saudi-led intervention in Yemen, which was undertaken partly to check Iran's regional ambitions. By contrast, Taliban's relations with the UAE and Saudi Arabia have become tense lately. So Taliban view Saudi Arabia and the UAE as being closely aligned with President Ghani's government and the US. So the two Gulf monarchies, i.e. the Saudi Arabia and UAE, also view with alarm the growth in Taliban ties with Iran and Qatar over the last several years. So this gives you um, a, snapshot, uh, a snapshot of what is changing and how the regional landscape has changed over the past few years. So the conflict in Afghanistan has three major dimensions, local, regional, and international. And it involves dozens of state and non-state actors. As I wrote in one of my BBC articles three years ago, the great game, the competition for influence, which started during the 19th century between Imperial Britain and the Tsarist Russia, continues today in a different way. The new great game not only involves more players, it is also messier with no or little respect for the rules of the game. As we know, the war in Afghanistan has been going on for more than four decades. The US and NATO has been fighting in the country for nearly 20 years, and it has already become the longest war in US's history. And the war in Afghanistan today is the biggest war in the world in terms of casualties that it causes mainly to civilians in Afghanistan. Therefore, a consensus is now emerging both in the region and beyond that there is no military solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, regional dynamics as well as the strategic landscape is changing, and the Taliban's diplomatic outreach has expanded over the past few years. Many regional players reviewed their policies and have opened dialogue with the Taliban. The Taliban have offered them the following assurances, not to allow ISIS or Daesh to establish a base in Afghanistan, to prevent foreign militants from using Afghanistan against these countries, and to continue to keep the Taliban's war focused on Afghanistan. But there is a new player on the Afghan scene, China. Beijing had taken a big seat in the 1990s. It was not so proactive and relied largely on its partnership with Pakistan when it came to handling the situation in Afghanistan. But China has been increasing its direct involvement in Afghanistan and is enhancing its role in the region. China has emerged as a major player in the Afghan peace process and is part of several frameworks and initiatives involving Afghanistan and the regional players as well as the US and the EU. China has a unique position. It has good relations with the Afghan government. It is also on friendly terms with the Taliban. Taliban delegations have visited China over the past few years. And of course, Beijing has cordial relations with Pakistan. Russia, too, has a unique and in some ways even better position than China. I'm thinking of India here and the recent China-India tension. It is on talking terms with all Russia. I mean, Moscow is on talking terms with all the major players in the Afghan conflict, the Afghan Taliban, the Afghan government, Iran, China, India, and the US. So in a way, Russia is talking or can talk to any major player in the region, especially those uh, that are involved in the uh, Afghan affairs. The Afghan peace process, especially the withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan, would have 
far-reaching regional consequences. Most of the key regional players, including Iran, Pakistan, Russia, and China, are against the permanent US and NATO military presence in Afghanistan and view it as a, as a strategic threat. Although Russia, China, Pakistan, and Iran supported the US intervention in Afghanistan in 2001, they have since become suspicious about Washington's intentions in the region. They are alarmed at the inability of the US to stabilize Afghanistan and to eliminate the drug industry and at the rise of ISIS in the country under its watch. They want the US to end its military presence in Afghanistan, but they also stress on a responsible US military withdrawal based on a negotiated settlement. They don't want to face the negative fallout of a security vacuum left by the withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan. India seems to be the only major player in the region which gets the more benefit from the continued US and NATO military presence in Afghanistan. If the peace talks result in a political settlement in Afghanistan, it will give a much needed break to the Afghans who have been experiencing perpetual violence since 1978. It could result in the Taliban becoming an important player with the Afghan, within the Afghan government inside the country. And it will also address many concerns of countries in the region and beyond who suffer from the side effects, including insecurity, drugs, refugees of the ongoing war in Afghanistan. But there are several problems. The biggest problem is the zero sum game mindset in the region. Secondly, suspicion and mistrust remain the biggest obstacle to stability in Afghanistan and the wider region. And thirdly, the inability of state actors to decouple the conflict in Afghanistan from their bilateral rivalries. State actors usually view Afghanistan in the prism of their own bilateral tension and interest, whether it is the rivalry between Pakistan and India, or Saudi and Iran, or the tension between Russia and the US. I don't doubt the sincerity of main actors, especially regional countries, when they say they want peace in Afghanistan. The problem is that they want they want peace. The problem is that they want peace on their own terms. The past few decades have shown that no country, even the US, has the means to impose its will in Afghanistan on its own. But many actors have created disorder in the past and have the capacity to disrupt the peace process. As mentioned, a big part of the chaos in Afghanistan is rooted in the wider region. Therefore, the solution needs cooperation and wider consensus. One positive outcome of the shifting regional alliances might be a more inclusive approach towards stabilizing Afghanistan and its neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Azami, for, for such a, a, a sort of thorough and accessible overview, actually. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up, and I know this is a, a sort of very sort of blank way of saying it, but is, is there, with the US pulling out and this new geopolitical thing, is it a positive thing, or all, the, all of those obstacles that you mentioned just now makes it a negative thing? Well, the war has become more complicated over the past few years, and the Taliban have become more powerful. As I mentioned in my presentation, Taliban have now links with more countries, especially in the region. Traditionally, Pakistan was accused of supporting the Taliban, which Pakistan usually denies, as you know. But now they have links with more players and more uh, regional players and even bigger players in the region. And uh, in 2001 and two, after the fall of the Taliban regime, the estimated number of Taliban fighters was between five and 8,000. And by 2009 and 10 and 11, the estimated, num estimated number of Taliban fighters reached uh, around uh, 25,000. And now latest figures show that the number of Taliban fighters is more than 60,000. So, on one hand, reconstruction went on in Afghanistan. Uh, there are institutions, there's, uh, there's an army and police force, uh, very capable. But on the other hand, the Taliban have become more powerful. They have uh, better weapons. Uh, they have uh, uh, more people uh, to use in the battlefield. And they have an expanded network in the region. 
And in the meantime, there are tensions uh, between the U.S. and Russia, and now more tensions between the U.S. and China. So they, those, these tensions, uh, the existing, existing tensions between Iran and uh, uh, Saudi and Pakistan and India, they were already there. So the regional landscape is becoming more complicated, and it is having a very negative impact on Afghanistan. And as okay. I said in my presentation, most of the important regional players now want the U.S. and NATO to leave Afghanistan. So the fear is that unless uh, these tensions are resolved, these uh, rivalries are resol resolved, which, which is unlikely in the short term, the conflict in Afghanistan will become even messier. So that's why there is a consensus within Afghanistan, in the region, as well as uh, in the international community that uh, this conflict doesn't have a military solution. There needs to be talks. Uh, okay. So in the first phase, we have seen that there has been a U.S.-Taliban agreement. Now everybody is waiting for the intra-Afghan dialogue, meaning the talks between the Afghan Taliban and the Afghan government and other uh, factions that are supporting the Afghan government. So uh, we don't know how long that would take. We don't know uh, whether there will be peace at the end of uh, these talks. But this is something that hasn't been tried in the past. War has been tried uh, in the past, but uh, this kind of uh, mechanism uh, or the involvement of uh, so many players in the peace process is something new and okay. untested. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for for nailing that down, because I think that our next speaker, we're going to go to possibly something even bleaker, Ambassador Hussein Haqqani, who is the former ambassador of Pakistan to the US and also director of South and Central Asia at the Hudson Institute. He's going to be telling us about why the Taliban are an irreconcilable enemy on account of their ideology and how they still maintain ties with Al Qaeda and why they cannot be trusted as negotiating partners given their track record. Uh, Ambassador Hakani, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by uh, recalling an article I wrote in 2012 in the New York Times. Uh, I had just resigned as Pakistan's ambassador to the US. I was well aware of the Obama administration's outreach to the Taliban and their efforts uh, at trying to get what they called a peace settlement. Uh, I warned against it. Uh, I recalled all the earlier efforts going back to the 1990s to reach out to the Taliban, which the Americans had made. Uh, and on all occasions, uh, both the Pakistani government and the Taliban misled the Americans. Uh, when the Americans asked the Taliban to hand over bin Laden, they said, we don't have him. Uh, the Pakistanis suggested that the Americans should try and buy uh, Osama bin Laden from the Taliban. Uh, so uh, my argument was that you cannot ignore the belief system and the core ideology of the Taliban. The Taliban are not a pragmatic political party that is more interested in getting power. They have a belief system and their belief system is what made them aligned with Al-Qaeda. Uh, if you remember, Osama bin Laden actually took an oath of allegiance to Mullah Omar as the Amir of Afghanistan. Even now, in negotiations uh, that they have held with the Americans, uh, the Taliban have insisted on referring to themselves as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. And the way the Taliban see the situation, they, were the they ran the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The Americans came. Uh, the Americans attacked Afghanistan. The Americans occupied Afghanistan. And now the Americans are willing to leave Afghanistan. And so all the Taliban are interested in is to negotiate terms that will make it easier for the Americans to leave. On the American side, the problem is that there is no strategic thinking about Afghanistan in the Trump administration. Uh, President Trump does not want to leave Afghanistan because he thinks it's in the strategic interest of the United States to leave Afghanistan. It is basically a phenomenon of American uh, uh, Americans losing interest. I often say, especially to my American uh, friends, that America has such a strong military that it just cannot lose a war, but it can lose interest. And that is exactly what has happened in case of Afghanistan. If you see all the commentary of the last few years, everybody counts the number of years America has been in Afghanistan. Uh, it is 
uh, is uh, said that we could not uh, subdue the Taliban without recognizing the fact that it is impossible to end an insurgency that is actively supported by a neighboring state. Uh, all the Taliban leadership has remained in Pakistan throughout the war. Uh, there is no question of this being just an allegation. I'm a Pakistani, I'm a former Pakistani official, and I have no qualms in acknowledging that the Taliban leaders have uh, lived in Pakistan consistently uh, since after the removal of the Taliban from power in Afghanistan. The Taliban also have made it very clear that their core ideological beliefs haven't changed. Uh, that is why they have only made very vague promises to the Americans uh, about talking to other Afghans, but they continue to say that the talks will be only to create an Islamic government in Afghanistan, which in their worldview uh, reflects the kind of government that they had before. Will they be a little softer for a little while? Maybe they will uh, sort of just cane women rather than whipping them? Maybe. But then we've seen that hardcore ideologies, unless they are actually modified, uh, result in a uh, revival of the old patterns uh, of behavior. And so I do not anticipate a better behavior from the Taliban. As far as the regional players are concerned, we must understand that Pakistan has a long-standing concern about Afghanistan, which goes back to the origins of Pakistan. Pakistan is a new state. Uh, it was There was no Pakistan in history. Uh, so Pakistan's uh, military has developed a kind of a, 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 a complex about Pakistan's national identity. And it basically considers the uh, historic identities of the people that constitute Pakistan today as uh, the real challenge to Pakistan. And there is a belief that India supports revival of those identities. So for example, uh, a significant part of Pakistan uh, comprises traditional Pashtun lands that were at one point Afghan and uh, only the British managed to uh, break them away and make them part of British India. Uh, that part of British India became part of Pakistan against the uh, will of the Pashtun people of Pakistan at that time at least. Uh, if you remember in the 1946 election that resulted in the acceptance of the demand for Pakistan by the British government in India, uh, the uh, Pashtun area had voted against uh, the, uh, the All India Muslim League that wanted Pakistan. So there was this historic fear that Afghanistan would like to create a greater Afghanistan comprising all Pashtun areas. And that was the origin of Pakistan's meddling in Afghanistan long before the Mujahideen, long before the Taliban. And there has been a, a, a zero sum game in that sense. We don't want any Indian presence in Afghanistan, even though Afghan governments before the Soviet occupation uh, worked very hard to try and assure Pakistan that they had no intention of letting their territory be used against Pakistan. During the 1965 and 1971 wars, Afghanistan actually was sympathetic to Pakistan rather than having Indians come in and attack Pakistan. But that hasn't changed the Pakistani military's fear of an Indian presence in uh, Afghanistan. There is no offensive Indian presence in Afghanistan currently. Uh, there are no Indian troops. Uh, at most, Pakistan says that there are uh, Indian intelligence operatives, uh, but surely there are Pakistani intelligence operatives. So Pakistan's concerns about Afghanistan that have led Pakistan to support the Taliban, in my humble opinion, uh, are irrational. And therefore, a deal between the Americans and the Taliban, removing the Americans from Afghanistan, will not uh, allay those fears. Uh, psychological fears uh, can only best be dealt with psychologically, not through a, a pragmatic agreement uh, uh, by diplomats. Now, what is likely to happen? Well, uh, I think that the Taliban will insist on restoring their emirate. Uh, yes, they are stronger, uh, as Professor Azami said, uh, but they are stronger because Pakistan has armed them, Pakistan has provided them with the equipment. Uh, the a uh, common view is that the United States could not subdue the Taliban. I think it is an incorrect assessment. It is just that the Americans and the NATO allies were not willing to go beyond a certain threshold in dealing with the Pakistan dimension of the Afghanistan problem. So what are we looking forward to? Well, I think that the intra-Afghan talks are going to be very complicated. 
complicated. Uh, the deal that the Americans have is a withdrawal deal. It's not a peace deal. Uh, the uh, uh, Taliban, uh, whatever they agree upon, will not result in an agreement that will be binding or considered binding by the Taliban. The Taliban have a uh, uh, so so they they have an Islamic jurisprudential perspective in which they split hairs uh, often. And so they are very likely, for example, even now they say that we agreed to uh, not attack American bases. We did not agree to not attack uh, the Afghan forces. And so therefore we are continuing to attack the Afghan government and we are abiding by the agreement with the Americans. Such hair splitting when it is applied to intra-Afghan situation is not going to result in peace. Uh, Pakistan is as tired of the war as anybody else. 40 years is a long time, and Pakistan has been the uh, main base for this war. But that said, Pakistani, uh, the Pakistan military also uh, sort of has a sunken cost uh, uh, approach to the situation. They will really want to win. And I think that they will step up support for the Taliban and try to help them, quote unquote, win in Afghanistan. Once that situation comes about, I think that the current understanding between the Taliban and other regional players like Russia and Iran will uh, wither away uh, because Russia will not accept the old style Taliban again. Uh, they are interested in the Americans leaving Afghanistan, but they are not interested in the old style Taliban rule of uh, a, a hardcore Sharia enforcement. Uh, Similarly, Iran will have problems with the Taliban because the Taliban remain very hostile to uh, Shias and they will need economic support. And at that point, the economic support for running a country uh, will either have to come from the West, which I don't think will be as generous uh, as it has been in the past. I don't think that uh, European governments in particular uh, would be interested in supporting a Taliban government or a government that is dominated by the Taliban. Uh, and the uh, the only countries that they would be able to look to are Arab Islamic countries. So those countries not do not have a good relationship with Iran. So so the future government of Afghanistan, whatever it is, will have to figure out how to provide for running their government. Lastly, there is the role of China. I would like to point out that China and Pakistan have been close allies for more than fifty years. Uh, and now Pakistan is firmly in the Chinese camp. <clears throat> I live in Washington, D.C., and many people in this town uh, still want to believe that Pakistan, the former Cento and Seattle ally, uh, will eventually uh, cut its relationship with China uh, uh, and come back to the Western fold. And there is a constant effort to do that. It's understandable. Pakistan is a nuclear-armed country, and uh, nobody wants a nuclear-armed country uh, going uh, in a direction uh, that will uh, uh, make conflict uh, inevitable. But as long as the Pakistan military is in charge in Pakistan, the Pakistani military has a very simplistic worldview. Uh, there are a lot of recent books that explain that. It is essentially a uh, zero-sum approach, approach to India. Uh, Pakistan needs to avenge past defeats by India militarily. And Pakistan needs to consider India an eternal enemy. And in their minds, Afghanistan is an extension of Pakistan's India problem. So therefore, the Pakistani uh, uh, desire to continue to control Afghanistan uh, will remain Pakistan's fundamental policy. And the Chinese considering that they have so many equities in Pakistan and Pakistan is their critical ally in the South and Central Asian region, uh, they will continue to support Pakistani uh, uh, control of Afghanistan and at the same time expand their own influence. Uh, historically, Afghanistan has always needed some kind of consensus between regional powers to be able to maintain its uh, uh, economy as well as uh, its uh, sovereignty. So for a long time, the Russian Empire and the British Empire understood that Afghanistan had to be uh, a buffer between them. 
and the British primarily provided the subsidies that enabled rulers in Afghanistan uh, to run their country. Uh, and, and, and subsequently, during the Cold War also, uh, the Americans and the Soviets tried to balance each other in Afghanistan. Uh, that balance was upset in 1979, and that balance has not yet been restored. And I don't think that the return of the Taliban to power is going to restore that balance. Lastly, uh, what if a deal does work out and uh, the Taliban give up the idea of controlling Afghanistan fully, but become part of a political process and system? I think that that could happen theoretically, but not practically. Uh, for example, the Taliban want Afghanistan uh, to return to more or less the 7th or 8th century. Uh, how do those who want Afghanistan to move into the 21st century negotiate with them and find common ground? Settle on the 14th century? I don't think that's going to happen. So the Taliban in numerical terms do not represent an overwhelming uh, a sort of view and opinion inside Afghanistan. They are just a group, an insurgent group, a bit like, in fact, I would suggest to everybody who is listening to me uh, to go back and look at what happened in uh, Cambodia, where the Khmer Rouge were a bit like the Taliban, uh, a group that had been in power in the past, a long insurgency, long running civil war, and eventually a lot of complicated negotiations to try and see if they could be brought in into the fold. And while one or two or three of their leaders did join the government, uh, the entire group never did. And the group then basically militarily withered away. In Afghanistan, the better way forward might be to continue to strengthen the government in Afghanistan, even after the Americans have withdrawn more or less completely. Only a strong Afghan government that is built on a consensus of non-Taliban factions can save Afghanistan from the Taliban. If the Taliban do get an upper hand in Afghanistan, as is likely, I am one of those who fears that it will enhance the Islamist narrative around the world. Uh, the jihadis have always argued that we, meaning the jihadis, defeated the Soviet Union. They defeated a superpower just by their faith and small arms. Now, there will be a revival of that perspective that the Soviet Union was defeated in Afghanistan by jihad. Now, the Americans are being defeated by a jihad in Afghanistan. And we will see a resurgence of jihadi uh, ideology all across the world. I wish I had more positive and optimistic things to say. But as you know, uh, a pessimist is only an optimist with greater experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Hakani. That was a fairly depressing and complex outlook. And maybe we can uh, nail down some of those complexities. I just want to say to everybody that's, uh, that's listening and watching this webinar, we're getting in your questions. So keep, keep uh, asking them. And then we're going to start running them under the screen uh, in a few minutes from now so that you can see the, the, where the, the views are around the world. And then we're going to box them together. Uh, I will pick up on some of them and then we can box them together into issues and give those to the panelists at the, at the end when we open up uh, the webinar for questions. Uh, but Right now, we're lucky enough to have with us the first secretary of the Embassy of Afghanistan in London, uh, Navid Normal, and he's going to explain to us, well, hopefully put in perspective the last two views that we've heard and see if you can sprinkle on a bit of forensic optimism uh, to this debate. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Humphrey. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this uh, important discussion today. Uh, so, uh, as mentioned by the other two distinguished panelists, as we move forward with, uh, with, uh, with the peace talk, with the intra-Afghan negotiations and talks, uh, there are optimisms uh, about, uh, about the opportunity that, has, that we have at the moment to start a negotiation about, about the long conflict that we had. However, these optimisms are definitely mixed with a lot of challenges and concerns. 
Uh, we do understand that peace is a fundamental process. Um, uh, we have a consensus over that. Uh, there's a national consensus as well as international. Um, uh, the people are, 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 are looking forward to, 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 to the intra afghan negotiations. There is a consensus within the government of Afghanistan and within the politicians. So to begin the intra afghan talks, the government of Afghanistan has released more than 4,000 of, uh, of uh, prisoners um, uh, to make sure that there is a space for cooperation and talks uh, however, on the other hand, uh, which, which was uh, basically a call on the Taliban to reduce the violence, uh, to make sure that this space of cooperation is open, it hasn't been welcomed by them, uh, which is making it more difficult and it could be a disruption to the peace process. Uh, they may want to gain advantage through, uh, uh, through violence, but we should, uh, we should understand that a humanitarian ceasefire, which has been called on many times by the international community, as well as the government of Afghanistan, is something that will keep up the momentum and will open up this space for all of us to go and start the talks. On the Afghanistan side, the Afghan government is ready. They have, uh, they have formed the National Reconciliation uh, Council, uh, as well as the negotiation team is introduced and they are ready to go and negotiate. Uh, however, there is a, a collective concern uh, over the Taliban's targeting the civilians. Uh, the, we, have, we have been seeing the numbers are increasing day by day. Um, and in the past two uh, meetings that we have in the past couple of weeks with our regional partners, as well as international uh, community partners, friends, uh, we had agreed on, on a couple of things. There were consensus over, um, uh, over, over the fact that uh, that there should be a continuation of uh, strengthening the, 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 the prospects of peace, uh, that uh, definitely the continuation of conflict in Afghanistan will, ha will have adverse impacts on, on the region. And uh, there was also consensus over, uh, over the fact that there should be an immediately uh, reduction of violence by the Taliban, and as well as an access uh, uh, to, 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 to the public in order to be able uh, to uh, to uh, uh, deliver basically humanitarian uh, help uh, to those who are affected by the COVID-19. Mm, and uh, there is also a consensus over the preservation of the women's right, the gains of the past 18 years uh, that we have had. Uh, so these are uh, the, 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 the very important things that were discussed and unanimously agreed with, uh, between our international partners about it. And we have also had an offer from um, from the government of uh, from more than twelve countries, basically, to to host the intra Afghan talks, uh, which is a good news. Basically, it means that we have an international support, and the regional partners are are trying to basically give the support for the for the Afghan uh, for the intra Afghan talks. Uh, however, it's very important that I would like to say here that there will be. Uh, uh, Sorry. Um, so there will be a lot of scenarios discussed, uh, but uh, 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 we have to make sure that uh, we are, the process is going to, to, to preserve. Sorry. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, there, there is a, we should, we should, we should make sure that there is a, that our collection effort is basically to, to focus on the on the preservation of the 18 years gains, which is basically the republic, the constitution, and the values. Because, uh, we, uh, as as mentioned by Ambassador Hapani, the Taliban uh, are basically gathered together. They're they're mo they're mostly together only on and agreeing on only one 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 element, which is war. So that's something that's keeping them together. But they should also agree to a fact that. The Afghanistan that they have they have experienced has totally changed, and there are values that has been basically the people of Afghanistan have paid a very high price for it uh, to basically get uh, get those gains and achieve them, and for them it's very important uh, to see or to be able to choose who will govern their 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 their, their political government. Uh, uh, finally, I would like to say that uh, uh, the post peace agreement uh, 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 should be something that. Uh, that uh, people should be able to move forward and not to start back 
from the scratch or from or, or from from zero. Uh, so I'll be happy to take questions if there's any. Um, and uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, thank you, Navid, and thank you for handling that uh, that. Uh, uh, I don't know what interruption so skillfully there gave a yeah, gave a yeah, touch yeah. of humanity to the debate. Yeah, I know um, it, it, it happened, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, today I have cool. to, I have to look after my daughter too, so uh, her mom is not there. Uh, but sorry for that. Not at all. Not at all. It was, it was it was very good to see actually, and the way you you carried on so so brilliantly from it. Um, there are, are questions coming in, um, and there are questions about India. There's one. Um, uh, for you, Navid, if if uh, just uh, just if you can answer it very very briefly, sure. um, the, they want to know during these these talks with the Taliban or whatever, what is your stand going to be on women, gender rights, and freedom of the media? Uh, will that continue, or will you compromise? Definitely, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the the gains the, the the one of let's put it this way. So. When I talk about the the past uh, year's gains, it's basically uh, including or comprising basically the human rights, the media rights. One of the one of the I would say we are one of the most uh, uh, successful countries in the region in terms of our our freedom of speech. So those things are basically our very important values that they will not be compromised by any means. Non-negotiable. Definitely. Okay. Thank you very much. Happy I said we will be happy to talk about it, but it's not something because it's the hard gains of the people and it's the people of Afghanistan who would be deciding what they want and how, how, how they want their government to look like in the future. Thank you. We, we're now going to, to move on and, and we're going to start running uh, questions across the screen. Now we've got into the flow of the debate uh, a, a little bit, just to give you an indication of what people are thinking and how they're reacting. There's a lot of questions coming in about India. What should India's role be in Pakistan? And similar ones about that compromise to the freedoms that have been won and whether they will be lost in war or compromised in debate. Uh, and we're now going to uh, Afra Saeed Katak, the former Pakistani senator and analyst of regional affairs. He's going to be talking to us about at the role of regional players, particularly Pakistan and Iran, which we've which we've touched on and, and heard quite a lot about, and on the ongoing peace and reconciliation process, and what uh, how those two will mesh together and, and impact on the future. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, as former Senator Katak. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Democracy Forum for organizing this important uh, webinar. Uh, my work is easy because uh, my esteemed friends uh, Daoud Azmi and Hussein, Mr. Hussein Akani, Ambassador Akani, have really very uh, comprehensively thrown light on the situation which I'm going to discuss. I think uh, uh, the prospects are quite bleak because the Doha deal between Taliban and U.S. had a very narrow and flawed uh, framework. Uh, you see, it, it is more, it's just about Americans' withdrawal from Afghanistan. It's not about uh, peace and reconciliation in Afghanistan. So that gives an edge to uh, Taliban. And uh, this is something which uh, is really a matter of great concern for Afghan uh, civil society and non-Taliban sections on, uh, of, of Afghan. You see, uh, Pakistani policy in Afghanistan was shaped in Cold War by General Ziaul Haq. Uh, it, it was called strategic depth in Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan had lost uh, East Pakistan, and it was uh, generally thought that Pakistan will have uh, will hegemonize Afghanistan, and in a way, it will be sort of compensation for Pakistan's loss of its eastern part. And it it, it was a very uh, myopic policy, but unfortunately. in the Western grand strategy to defeat the Soviet forces. Uh, after the withdrawal of Soviet forces, we saw that peace could not uh, be established because uh, Mujahideen, uh, who were trained by Pakistan and supported by US, uh, Saudi Arabia, and other uh, countries, uh, they, they were not able to deliver 
So Taliban came uh, into being and Pakistan became uh, very uh, strong and consistent supporter of Taliban. And uh, Pakistani policy, the more it changes, the more it remains the same. Uh, so Pakistan uh, support for Taliban, even after uh, September 11, uh, when uh, they, they were overthrown by United States, uh, but they came to Pakistan, they regrouped and uh, they, they, with the support of uh, elements in Pakistani state system and non-state player, they were able to reorganize and fight against United States and NATO. And this fight is coming to an end. I, now, uh, I agree with uh, my friends that the uh, situation is not very uh, bright because, you see, Iranian intentions can't be really uh, good because uh, it's uh, facing a lot of pressure from United States and Western countries. Uh, so uh, it, can, uh, it can get some leverage by destabilizing Afghanistan. Uh, you see, it, it can have uh, uh, some transactional relations uh, with uh, America, United States and Europe uh, by uh, get, getting some uh, leverage in Afghanistan by, by creating instability and by uh, imposing some certain conditions. Pakistan's interest in Afghanistan is such that it really uh, is, uh, is, is not really opening up to uh, non-Taliban uh, Afghans. That is the most serious uh, flaw in Pakistani policy. Taliban, you see, uh, like uh, Afghan Mujahideen, they, they are a very efficient fighting machine. But it, it, it was like a perpetual IRA without its Shen Fen. Uh, you see, they, they, in Doha, they have a political office, but inside Afghanistan, you don't see any political activity. They, they, they have developed an addiction to violence and to an extremist ideology. You see, their, their emirate, Islamic emirate, which they call, uh, is really uh, a torpedo uh, for modern state system in Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think Pakistani uh, government can show some support for peace for asking Taliban not to insist on their emirate, imposing their emirate by the barrel of the gun on Afghanistan. That is, I mean, the most crucial test of Pakistani policy. Although Pakistani politicians and Pakistani generals have been saying that uh, they have changed the old policy. But uh, you see, as long as Taliban sanctuaries are there, and it's again very interesting, in Doha uh, process, you didn't hear about these sanctuaries in Pakistan or in Iran. Iran has also developed relations with Taliban. Iran has other allies, uh, ethnic allies in Afghanistan. And in the past, it has been supporting those allies against uh, Taliban in their fight uh, in that proxy war in 90s. Uh, but, but you see, there's nothing about these foreign uh, bases of Afghan fighters, militants. You see, for us Pakistanis, uh, particularly civil society, democrats in Pakistan, our uh, concern is that Talibanization of Afghanistan can have a fallout for Pakistan. And even uh, now, when Taliban are uh, sort of asserting themselves in Afghanistan, they are also active on Pakistani side of the border. And uh, they are also uh, really uh, threatening uh, uh, democratic forces, peaceful forces. And unfortunately, Pakistani state has not been able to uh, dismantle structures of militancy. You see, we, we have had a lot of... Uh, uh, operations, military operations, and we have had a lot of uh, declarations, announcements by Pakistani government. But on the ground, we still have these militant uh, structures. And uh, if they are empowered in Afghanistan, they will definitely have a fallout. And in the past, we have suffered a lot. Uh, 60,000 uh, Pakistanis were killed by these terrorists. And uh, they went as far as uh, Karachi uh, and the uh, coast of Indian Ocean. Uh, so, so it can be uh, threatening Pakistani peace, but unfortunately, Pakistani uh, generals who uh, deal with Afghanistan, Afghan policy of Pakistan have not been very sensitive to these concerns of common citizens in Pakistan. You see, uh, unfortunately, uh, pa Pakistan has its own uh, militants in, inside Pakistan, and if there is a sanctuary in Afghanistan, uh, it, it can be a reverse uh, strategic depth for Pakistani militants in Afghanistan. So uh, that, that is a very uh, serious uh, question for Pakistani uh, democrats and people who believe in constitution and rule of law. 
but uh, you see, uh, unfortunately, the Pakistani military generals have not been very kind to democracy in their own country. So uh, I don't think we can expect them to be sympathetic to a democracy uh, and constitution in Afghanistan. But I think democratic forces in both the countries have to uh, support each other and express solidarity uh, and also uh, try to understand that uh, for Pakistan, there is a lot of potential in good relations with Afghanistan if Pakistan changes its uh, old policy of the Cold War era. And Pakistan opens up for trade. Uh, uh, Central Asia can be accessed through Afghanistan. And Afghanistan can have access to its trade with India through Pakistan. And this can be a win-win situation uh, for uh, both countries and all sides, in fact. China is a new player. But Chinese uh, believe that they can handle Taliban by involving them in economic activity. That, that, that is possible only if Taliban lose uh, their patrons who support them for military activity. Uh, only then Chinese can really uh, implement what they are thinking about. But so far, uh, I think Taliban still have supporters uh, who uh, will support them in their fighting in Afghanistan. And also, uh, they have support from uh, Iran, uh, both Iran and Pakistan. They have strong supporters, although uh, they have relations with China and Russia also. But I think uh, their main basis uh, uh, remain in Pakistan, and their support also comes from Iran. So uh, I, I believe that uh, if we just have a look at their past behavior, and they have not shown any regrets, uh, they have not gone for any self-criticism or uh, any intention of correcting themselves. You see, in September 1996, when they entered Kabul, what were the six or seven major steps that they took? They banned Afghan national flag. They banned Afghan national anthem. Radio Kabul was renamed as Vice of Sharia. It, was, it is very ironic that it, this is not the name of Radio Islamabad, the Radio Tehran, but Radio Kabul was renamed as uh, Vice of Sharia. They banned Nowruz, the New Year's Day, I mean, the 5,000 years old festival. They also banned Jirga, the most important social institutions of Pashtuns. They also killed, murdered uh, Dr. Najibullah, the former president of Afghanistan, who had resigned uh, to establish peace in his country. They also uh, demolished Buddha, uh, the old monument in Afghanistan. That was uh, so something historical. It, it was part of Afghan identity, but it, it seems that they were uh, let loose in Afghanistan to demolish identity. You see, uh, Afghan, Afghans, uh, Afghan national identity is Afghan Muslim. But the Taliban particularly exaggerated uh, this uh, Muslim part of the identity, not for the love of Islam, but to weaken the uh, other part, the Afghan part of it. So they have not shown any regret, uh, uh, I mean, if, if they really would be changed this time. And so, so far, uh, even the relation with Al-Qaeda and other uh, international terrorist groups uh, uh, have not fully uh, sort of uh, cut off. So uh, we, we have to watch the situation very uh, cautiously. And the international community need to uh, see, because in the uh, 1990s, when US and other powers put their back in Afghanistan, we saw anarchy and we saw the rise of terrorism, which threatened not only Afghanistan and South Asia, but also threatened the whole world. So let's not repeat that. Let's uh, go towards a peaceful solution. And for that, uh, I think Taliban uh, should know that the world would not really uh, like them to repeat what they did in 1990s. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Senator Katak, very much. Can I just try to ask you to encapsulate one thing for us all? Uh, is it your view or is it the case that the Pakistan military will not be happy until a Taliban compliant government or, 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 or majority in government is in power in Kabul? Is that the case? Will the Pakistan military only be happy when a, a, a compliant Taliban government or, or large section of the government is in power in Kabul? Well, Pakistan military has invested a lot in Taliban. And unfortunately, they have chosen Taliban as their most reliable ally in Afghanistan, inside Afghanistan. Pakistan uh, uh, government, particularly Pakistan military, has not been able to develop close relations with other sections of Afghan society. 
although Pakistan, President Pakistani military leaders, uh, particularly uh, General Bajwa, who heads uh, Pakistan Army, uh, has uh, uh, repeated it many times that Pakistan will not take sides. But uh, it doesn't sound very credible when you see realities on the ground, because Taliban still enjoy their uh, sanctuaries in Pakistan. One would uh, really, uh, I mean, be, uh, one would expect that Pakistan would uh, also uh, go for actions in what it is saying. Uh, and the word and the deed should come together. And th that would be very convincing. The uh, actions will speak louder than words. But so far, I, I, I don't, I, I haven't seen really uh, a, a major departure. Although Pakistan has helped the United States in its uh, negotiations with Taliban, uh, that in, Pakistan has delivered there. And, and you see, for Pakistan, uh, I mean, its influence in Afghanistan is the major card in its relations with the United States. Uh, Pakistan can get concessions on this uh, issue. Uh, so uh, Pakistan is using this card. But uh, ultimately, uh, Pakistan has to decide about Taliban. And uh, Pakistan also faces a difficult task in balancing its relations between China and the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, one uh, comment on that comes in. Uh, wounded hubris sums up the PAC army, uh, says one of our uh, audience out here. Uh, I would now like to bring in Dr. Antonio Giustosi, who's a visiting professor at King's College London and a fellow of the Royal United Services Institute, also in London. Uh, Antonio is going to tell us about the Taliban's views about these peace negotiations, whether what we just heard on the Pakistan and, and that sort of thing is happening, and the new status quo, which of course includes, uh, as the new status quo for all of us all over the world, uh, the expanding influence of China. Uh, Antonio, the, the floor or the screen is yours. Thank you, Humphrey, and uh, thank you, Democracy Forum, for giving me this chance of... Uh, expressing my views on what's going on in Afghanistan, what the Taliban think about it. Uh, I think we know we have to be fair to the Taliban. We don't have to demonize them, however far away from our point of view they might be. We have to acknowledge that, uh, you know, this is a situation where inevitably the different sides, whether Washington, Kabul, the Taliban, Islamabad, Tehran and whatever, are injecting a lot of propaganda uh, in the media. If you try to assess the situation objectively, I, I do believe that uh, the leadership of the Taliban, so Abatullah and the people around Abatullah, do want peace in Afghanistan. They want it not because they are lovers of peace in particular or because they love democracy and freedom, whatever, but I think because it is the interest of the Taliban political leadership to have peace. Why? First of all, Abatullah has not been chosen as a leader, succeeding his sex was killed by the Americans, uh, because he's a war leader. He's not a war leader. In fact, he's not at all a war leader. He's a, probably one of the, possibly the least experienced in war making of the Taliban, or the top Taliban figures. He's essentially a political leader and a, and a mullah, of course, being a, from the Taliban. So it's got credentials higher than most of his colleagues as a, as a mullah, as a cleric, but very little in terms of military credibility. He has to make peace to stay in power. He's not been put there by his colleagues and by the Pakistanis to win a war. He's been put there to make peace. If he doesn't make peace and then the world goes back to the to the battlefield, to the to the armies, then he has to go because not the person without the capability, the skills to lead the Taliban to victory. For that, the Taliban need, uh, you know, and they have a capable, uh, efficient military leader with experience, with credibility. Most importantly, uh, as a military leader, credibility among the rank and file, the people who have to die in order for the Taliban to win the war. So that's why I think he's serious about achieving peace. And uh, I think the, the way it's portrayed by propaganda, the Taliban have their own propaganda, which is also completely biased, you know, but propaganda is always biased, the nature of propaganda to be biased. If you look at the data, 
what the Americans have recently given us, statistics about the casualties of the Afghan security forces since the signature of the agreement in Taliban and uh, Americans is minus 40%. So the casualties of the Afghan security forces are down 40%, which is, I believe, a serious uh, indicator of the fact that violence is going down. It's not stopped, clearly, but it's going down. The Taliban have not claimed a single uh, terrorist attack in Kabul. There have been terrorist attacks. Some Taliban are involved, but the leadership is not behind these attacks. So there are spoilers, and this, I'm going to discuss this in a minute. There are spoilers within the Taliban who don't want peace. But if you're talking about the official leadership of the Taliban, they do want peace. Peace. What does it mean, peace? Of course, peace, this is the issue. Peace means different things to different actors. The Taliban are not stupid, at least the Taliban leadership, those who had the chance of living a relatively normal life in Pakistan, Qatar, and somewhere else, uh, some in Iran, uh, they're still rational thinkers. They're still able to think rationally. It's different from somebody who spent, if he's still alive, 20 years under the bombs, you know? From that kind of person, you don't expect a lot of rationality at this point. But the people who were lucky enough to spend most of their time in a, some kind of safe haven are still able to do, you know, the, in their own way, rational calculation, and they are doing it. And they think that this deal that the Americans are kind of offering to them is good for them. That's why they want it. They want. The, that's why they want to implement it. The deal, of course, is complex because the the way it's worded is very loose. You know, the American Taliban deal is subject to different interpretation because the wording is very loose. So everybody, in a sense, can read whatever they want in it. But essentially, the deal promises uh, positive relations between American and Taliban after, after peace. So basically, it says, you know, we will continue, the Americans say, we will continue paying money to Afghanistan, perhaps a bit less, but still substantial amounts of money to Afghanistan, even if there will be a kind of coalition government, including the Taliban, in place. It's also saying a lot of interesting things. Uh, first of all, of course, with the withdrawal going on, the leverage of the Taliban vis-a-vis -vis their counterparts, so the, the Kabul government uh, and Afghan political parties and civil society increases. That's for the Taliban is good. Uh, it means that they can extract more at the negotiating table. But does it mean that the Taliban aim for uh, re-establishing the Taliban Emirate? Not because they wouldn't like it, but because they can't. None of the donors or the sponsors want that. Of all the powers in the region, they give money to the Taliban, and the, the list is long, basically apart from India, everybody uh, in various degrees has supported the Taliban. Russia has supported the Taliban in recent years. Iran, of course, has. Saudi Arabia, Qatar. Not much in our Emirates, but they have helped them in many ways, closing one eye, two eyes over their transaction, financial transaction in Dubai. And of course, Pakistan. So none of these countries has any interest or can afford to have the, the Emirate back in Kabul. And the reasons are various, depends on country to country. Some, they never wanted it. Some, they never liked it. They were supporting the Taliban for merely opportunistic reasons. But even the Pakistanis, even the Saudis, what they know is that they, they can't afford to humiliate the Americans. If the Americans leave and the Taliban take over, for Washington, where will be the president at that point in Washington? Would be a humiliation. The Americans will not be happy. They will not be happy with the Pakistanis and the Saudis who are guaranteeing essentially uh, peace, the peace process in Afghanistan. It's not the interest of Pakistan, sentinel at this point, to alienate the Americans. The, the whole peace process, in a sense, starts because Pakistan needs to stage a rapprochement with the Americans, with Washington. The Saudis have been having very good relations, you know, maybe slightly less good now than a year ago, two years ago, but, you know, they've always been having very good relations with America and certainly have no interest in uh, upsetting the Americans in this stage where they need, and they're cooperating very close with the Americans on Iran. So that's the main reason, I think, why uh, Abatullah and the people around him want and need and have to implement peace and they need to have some kind of 
co coalition government in the future. Then, of course, there will be a lot of tug of war over the shape of this government, the content, but they're not going, they can't go for the restoration of the Emirate. They do want, and they will try, and they're trying to figure out how to do that. They will want to bring more Sharia. They want will we want to Islamize uh, the, the functioning, the structures, the legislation of Afghanistan. And they already said, they already indicated that the way they think that should happen is by empowering a council of lema, of senior clerics, to essentially vet the existing legislation, any future legislation, to see whether it's in conformity with Islamic law. And that's the way they think, you know, gradually, they can push for a uh, process of Islamization or further Islamization of the Afghan state. Uh, if, if you like a, a, a reformist, in a sense, process of Islamization, not a revolution, a reform. And they do think that they could have uh, sufficient political support. They might be wrong, you know, but they do think they could have sufficient political support for achieving that. Why? I mean, the Taliban know that if there was an election in Afghanistan, they wouldn't win. I think they still overestimate the level of support they might get. It's very difficult to know because, you know, in the last election, 90% of people didn't vote. So it's very difficult to know who would vote in the future and for whom. But I think they, they know they won't get a majority. I believe they will get even less than they think, but they've been working a lot on alliances. It didn't start today, it's been two years at least that they have been meeting members, representatives of Afghan political parties. Of course, not all political parties, not leftist parties, which don't count very much in Afghanistan anyway, not secularist. But, you know, all the various Mujahideen parties uh, of Afghanistan, they were active in the 80s in the Jihad against the Soviet, they are now political parties. That actually, many of them fragmented into several rival parties. Many of these parties have had meetings, actually all of them have had meetings, the Taliban in Iran and Pakistan, to discuss the future, to see if there is any common ground. Because of course, if, they, if the Taliban give up violence, the difference between a Talib mullah and the average mullah in Afghanistan is not very big. Afghan mullahs are conservative, even by the standards of the region, maybe not so much of Pakistan, but in general they are uh, conservative. So, you know, yeah, there will be a few progressive mullahs, but the large majority of the mullahs are not very far from the way the Taliban think, except, you know, the main difference is that they refuse violence, and especially they refuse certain forms of violence like suicide bombing. But if the war is over, the difference disappears. So the Taliban think they can reach out to many of these clerics, and they have the majority of the clergy behind them. Why wouldn't they support the Taliban if the Taliban support the Islamization or the legislation of the education, etc., etc. It would be the self-interest of the clergy to support that. And what about these Islamic parties or different tendencies? Some of them belong to the Muslim Brother trend. They, in principle, have differences with the Taliban, but on certain issues, like Islamization, more Islamic law, why would they object to that? So I think the Taliban believe that on many issues they can form alliances and split, split or splinter the existing uh, anti-Taliban front, if you want to call it like that. So the parties are now in Kabul, in the parliament. They all more or less oppose the Taliban because of the violent campaign to take power. But if the campaign stops and the Taliban become a political actor, then the difference between some of these parties and the Taliban are less and the difference that exists now between uh, those parties, for example, President Ghani. So that's what the Taliban are banking on. They believe they can uh, form alliances and push through their agenda to quite a considerable extent. Having said that, much of the future Afghanistan will depend on the availability of resources, not only to keep the state running, but also, and this is more uh, like a concern for all of these actors, is to keep the parties running, because no, there's not a single Afghan political party, like the Afghan state itself, that is self-sufficient. A party that's self-sufficient in Afghanistan, that pays for its cost, won't make it to parliament, won't elect anybody to parliament. Perhaps Afghanistan is not so exceptional, actually, 
But for sure in Afghanistan, um, politics is expensive. It's more expensive than it should be for a country of that level of income. And the elections are very expensive. Presidential, parliamentary, party machines are expensive. You need to operate across the ground. You need to buy votes on a massive extent. You need to pay the tribal leaders to support you. Uh, much will depend on whether all these promises have been made by various countries and actors that support the peace process to have the Taliban score well in elections. If the Saudis, for example, will pay a lot of money to the Taliban, it will be different. You know, what the Taliban can achieve in an election with a, mil a billion dollars to spend compared to having, you know, a few million Afghanis to spend, it will be very different. So that will depend on whether this promise will be kept or not. You know, but the Taliban are promised by a range of actors, you know, you do peace and then we help you to Islamize a country. I mean, it would be, after all, the interest of Saudi Arabia in the long run to have uh, to Islamize Afghanistan. It's not convenient for a government like the Saudi government to have a secular, a kind of secular democracy in, Af in Afghanistan. You know, why would Afghanistan have a secular democracy when Arabia doesn't have it? You know, and that doesn't have any democracy in fact, you know. So the Taliban say after all, you know, we are in a sense, yeah, perhaps they're a bit, a bit out to digest, you know, for, for the Americans or for the friends in the West, but they say, we are, we are actually more, if you like, more liberal and progressive than the Saudis, than the Saudi government. You know, we are already made commitments to be, for example, to allow for women to have education, to be elected to parliament, you know. We, we are ready to commit to this. So in a sense, they say, you know, if you can digest the Saudis and some other the Gulf countries, why not us? So I think the Taliban believe that, yeah, there will be some noise and turmoil at the beginning, uh, but then, uh, you know, gradually, they would be, become more acceptable as a partner, eh? that they will be able to start Islamizing Afghanistan, not bring it back to the standard of the Islamic Emirate, but going so, somewhere in that direction. They will be able to form some alliances, and they will be able to be not only included in a, let's call it, interim government, they will inevitably be in power immediately after the reaching of some kind of agreement, if there will be an agreement, uh, but also they will be able to perform sufficiently well in any elections to be able to form alliances and form a coalition government for the long run and therefore implement their agenda. And this is what essentially what the current main donors want. Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, which are now again dominant, the, the Iranians are out, you know, they are, they are they're not happy about what's going on. They're not happy about the direction taken by the Taliban leadership. The Iranians are abandoning Abatullah and they are uh, turning their attention somewhere else. I think I'm running out of time, but just one more thing that I Thank promise you, I would say yeah. mm -hmm. on the spoilers, on the potential spoilers within Taliban, there are spoilers. There are spoilers, there are actors, quite a lot of commanders of the Taliban who still have very close relation with the revolutionary guards of uh, Iran, and they still have a relation, and of course they are told by the Revolutionary Guard, this is not good, this deal with America is not good, you should not support that. And there is talk of splitting, of forming a rival, let's call it whatever, you know, Taliban II or whatever, insurgency. But there are also those, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, those who were in the past supported by the Saudis, by others in the Gulf, like the Akhani, the Akhani NATO, who also oppose uh, this, despite, you know, Akani, Sergina Akani signing an article in the New York Times, but essentially they're still opposed to this process. They think that there's no, no good coming out of it for them. These actors are, are looking at what, you know, what the options are. They're looking for ways uh, for sabotaging the peace process. And they're doing it, you know, some of the attacks claimed by the Islamic State in Kabul are not carried out by the Islamic State, but by the spoilers. Uh, in the future, might be doing more, you know. Uh, and of course, on the, on, the, on the other side, those who see these attacks taking place and they see the evidence that is not the Islamic State, they point their fingers at whom? At the Taliban, at the leadership, you know, because they, held, they hold the leadership responsible for these attacks. It's a way of spoiling the process, you know, carrying out attacks, leaving some evidence behind, and then, of course, that creates a lot of turmoil. So far, the Americans have been unwilling 
to look at this evidence, I'm willing to point the fingers at the Taliban because for now, at least the Trump administration wants to go ahead, essentially, with this, you know, with this deal. But, you know, between now and then, between now and the convention of the door, there will be a lot of issues that will come up. A lot of actors, including Al-Qaeda, including the Central Asian jihadists in Afghanistan, never advertised their role in Afghanistan in the past, and now they release videos showing them attacking outposts together with the Taliban. You know, I wonder why they start doing that now. So there are a lot of actors who wouldn't want peace uh, within the Taliban, around the Taliban, who have some potential for derailing the peace process. Okay, Antonio, can I, can I uh, politely interrupt you there? Because we've got a lot of questions coming in on this topic. So what I'd like to do is, is uh, just before we move on to Tim Foxley to give us the various scenarios that there are going to be, I've got a, a couple of points. And, and what you said, Antonio, was quite chilling when you led off the national governments that had supported the Taliban, of course, Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right at the top of that list. Um, and then the spoilers, the, the Taliban is not a state actor. Uh, even if the leadership says there's going to be no violence, it will not be obeyed, as, we, as we've seen. Whereas if Britain or, or, or China tells its army to stop firing, that, that, that will happen. And then what we heard right at the beginning was that the Taliban is six or seven times stronger now than it was in 2001 uh, when it was overthrown by the United States. Uh, Tim Foxley is, is, is our last... Um, panelist, and um, he's an independent political military analyst. Uh, he has been there since the beginning, lived there, got his feet and hands very dirty there, and has analyzed it uh, right for the past uh, 20 years or so. He's going to talk to us about the likelihood of instability. Well, we've heard a bit about that, and throw out some scenarios that we can discuss during our question and answer session. And then after that, I think we still have uh, the Labour um, Member of Parliament, Barry Gardner, uh, who is going to give us a, a wrap right at the end. Uh, Barry uh, is a former uh, Shadow International Trade Secretary um, and a big follower of all that has been going on in Asia uh, uh, um, in current affairs, politics and culture for many years. So as long as he's not called away for a parliamentary vote, we will have him at the end of the question session. But for the moment, Tim, the screen is yours. Thank you, Humphrey. Uh, and thanks very much to the Democracy Forum for, for having me. And um, I wouldn't dream of claiming that 20 years is a, is a long time for, for, for looking at Afghanistan. I'm, I'm acutely aware that the people in, this, uh, in the audience and have been speaking that have been looking at Afghanistan for a much longer period than me. Uh, independent political military analyst uh, is great. Uh, I used to be a, a British government analyst up until 2014, focusing on Afghanistan, just so you have a little bit of bit of context. I'm now not working for any government or NGO, so my views here are, are purely my own. I've been asked to look ahead a few years, uh, and in 2006, Barnett Rubin was asked what changes he saw in the coming five years. And he replied, I have no idea. There were too many imponderables. If you'd asked five years ago what Afghanistan would be like today, I would have been completely wrong. And I don't expect that I'll be right this time. So I'm in reasonably good company as I, as I try and project forward. I was worried that I was going to be pouring cold water on the conference, but we've heard quite a lot of, of pessimistic views um, from the range of the, of the speakers. My tone will be pessimistic. And my theme, I guess, is perfect storm. I'd like to read from a New York Times article uh, by Alison Rubin from April 2013. She reports on the leaving speech by the then French ambassador in Kabul, Bernard Bajolet, who talked about the coming problems. And Bajolet said, I still cannot understand how we, the international community and the Afghan government, have managed to arrive at a situation in which everything is coming together in 2014. Elections, new president, economic transition, military transition, and all this whereas the negotiations for the peace process have not really started. And I guess now being sort of six, seven years further forward, we can take some comfort that there hasn't been a collapse uh, in Afghanistan. 
And 2014 was a big transition, a reduction of around 140,000 international troops down to around 12,000. But I think that would be missing the point. I think we're in a worse situation than we were in 2014. Um, to me, 2014 was part one of the international military withdrawal. And from 2014 to now, in, the, in this period, we've seen increased fighting, increased Taliban control across the country, and no talks. We're now entering part two, the complete removal of all US troops. So why do we assume that this is now the time for the Taliban to start compromising? I believe we're most likely to see more and messier violence, perhaps another three, four, five, even 10 years of fighting. After this, if the Afghan government and the armed forces of the Afghan government have held together, then perhaps the Taliban might recognize the value of real dialogue. There's a warning from Amrullah Saleh in 2012. He said, uh, you do not wake up one morning and the radio says it's civil war. The ingredients are already there under the very watchful eyes of the international community. So I will highlight briefly this perfect storm of problems that I can see and then look at possible future scenarios. We still have significant political instability in Afghanistan. You'll recall earlier this year we had two presidents uh, inaugurating themselves on the same day. So there are many rival factions and competing loyalties happening under the surface of the political system. There is significant economic instability and uncertainty again. And I commend Kate Clark's recent paper uh, looking at Afghanistan's economic situation. Afghanistan is still very much a rentier state and has been for two or three hundred years, almost entirely dependent upon foreign funding, no effective taxation system and much corruption. I think a lot of you will recall the much held, helded reports in around 2010 of the trillions of dollars of oil, minerals and precious metal wealth underneath Afghanistan's soil. This is mostly still under the ground and it's certainly not working for the benefit of the Afghan people. The military transition has transformed into a fast US retreat. The Taliban and the US are largely avoiding each other, that's good, but the Afghan armed forces are losing key components of American support, the airstrikes, the intelligence and the training. Parts of the Afghan police, the local police, appear to be shutting down later this year. There's a, there's a good paper uh, report from Stephanie Glinsky uh, in Nangarhar, where disbanded Afghan local police are defecting to the Taliban. And you only need a cursory look at the Afghan website to see their, the list of people that they claim have defected to them. And further to this issue, what do you do with tens of thousands of unemployed former fighters? This is potentially very destabilizing. How do you disband, reconcile and integrate? Who's going to pay for it most crucially? The neighbours and the near neighbours, and we've heard quite extensively already what, what the issues and problems are. Um, so, so briefly, the same geostrategic issues remain for all the neighbouring countries. This will, this will see positive and negative actions by each country, probably simultaneously. For neighbouring countries, Afghanistan remains an arena for rivalry and for competition. Uh, it goes without saying, we need to watch the actions of Pakistan very closely. And to echo Monsieur Bajalay again, peace negotiations have not yet begun. There is no evidence of serious talking or compromise, and the Taliban, as usual, are at best extremely vague about what they want. There is no ceasefire, and violence levels are increasing. The Taliban appear stronger than ever. Their increasing temptation to assault provincial capitals, Kunduz has been attacked know, three or four times, um, so we see a significant flexing of muscles from the Taliban. Other analysts, Thomas Ruttig, Michael Semple and others, are of the view that the Taliban are not interested in power sharing and they're planning to return to power. There are two factors Monsieur Bajalay could be forgiven for not predicting. COVID-19, which is greatly damaging inside Afghanistan in terms of the economy, the employment, uh, the healthcare system and security. Uh, but also outside of Afghanistan, where the usual Western countries and America are in an economic crisis uh, and they can no longer afford to spend as much on Afghanistan as they've done in the past. The final factor, Donald Trump. President Trump uh, is incompetent, disinterested and corrupt. He's also extremely erratic in his approach to most things. Um, Thomas Barfield made a point last week in a conference he worried that the Taliban were, were seeing Donald Trump as representing America and his, his personality and character 
signifies the way the Americans are keen to rush out of Afghanistan without concern for the future. And his concern is this is making the Taliban perhaps more confident than they, than they should be. So what sort of scenarios uh, does this throw up? Wider analysis of insurgencies and how they end is not optimistic. Most post-World War II insurgencies do not end in su successful negotiated settlements. One study suggests that only 20% end this way. Many deals collapse back into renewed fighting after two or three years. The rate of defections from one side to the other could be a key indicator of success or failure. But it seems to me all successful scenarios require four things, major international support, genuine Taliban willingness to compromise, major reductions in violence, and for the Afghan army to hold together. The negative scenarios will be characterized by meddling neighbors, increasing terrorism, Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, etc., and fragmented government. So with that in mind, here are four very crude broad brush scenarios, starting with, uh, I guess, a best, a best possible case and descending to sort of worst case. Best case, the Taliban and the Afghan government reach some form of accord based on genuine compromise. They rework the constitution to some extent, but most human rights and democratic issues remain intact. And crucially, this is endorsed by the population. The bulk of the Taliban reintegrate in some way and a Taliban political movement forms. There is then slow and painful economic and political improvement, and this is over a period of decades. There will be problems, of course, including periodic outbreaks of violence. The neighbouring countries play largely positive roles politically and economically. So the next level of scenario downwards would be something like a flawed compromise. Perhaps the deal was rushed into and agreed too early. There is some progress, but it's prone to collapse. The Taliban, the government and the warlords divide up chunks of the government to suit their own interests. The situation is very volatile. There is some slow and painful progress, but there is large outbreaks of fighting. And perhaps the Taliban fragments. Next level down. A stalemate. Government versus the Taliban. The government holds the cities and the main communication routes remaining dependent on foreign money. Uh, the talks go nowhere. The violence levels are up but not to the point of the collapse of the military. Parts of the country are beyond government control, either with Taliban or local warlord groups, perhaps the Taliban fractures. So the uh, most pessimistic stance um, is a slow slide over a number of years into a, a civil war, or however you want to define the conflict. The most dangerous would be something looking like the mid 1990s, where you have multiple groups. Multiple groups in an insurgency is much more messy, much more violent, and much more complex. So you would get the government versus the Taliban versus warlords versus the government. The Afghan armed forces largely fragment. There would perhaps be a large Taliban type bloc, perhaps supported by, Tal by Pakistan, operating in the south. Perhaps a large and fluid type of Northern Alliance, uh, so the groups operating in the north, a rump government confined to Kabul and a few other population centres. So to conclude, and apologies for my pessimism, um, in 20 years I've seen many surges of optimism come and go. My view is that we are slowly drifting towards more and messier fighting for several years, perhaps even five or ten. If 2014 was part one of the US downsizing, with increased violence, greater Taliban confidence, and no successful dialogue, we are in 2020 entering part two, the final part of the US withdrawal. I think we're going to see the same sort of pattern. I do not believe the Taliban yet have sufficient incentive to compromise to make peace talks a genuine success. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, very much indeed. Because I want to ask right at the end the panelists which option of yours they think is most likely. Could you separate off a bit number three and four, the stalemate and the slow slide? Um, because there seems to be a lot of overlap there. Could you just do that in, 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 a, in a few seconds for me? Yeah, well, well the, the short answer is I'm, I'm quite reluctant to do that. The, these are really crude settings and there is going to be a lot of overlap. And, and I think, you know, the end result, I mean, somewhere between a stalemate and a slip into a civil war, 
you would get most of the same factors apply. You, you know, you'd get sort of the fragmentation of the, uh, of the armed forces to a certain extent, uh, multiple groups emerging, pushing and pulling, so warlords, political factions. Um, so it's actually quite difficult. And I, I had to compromise a lot of my initial ideas and, and reducing it down to four, four okay. scenarios. Yeah. There were yeah. lots of permutations within that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's not, maybe not the best. So, the best so basically, basically, a slow slide is worse than a stalemate. Yes, I mean, I've done it as a descending thing. Yeah. A stalemate is, is sort of, I mean, you could argue roughly where we are now, you know, right. plus or minus a few problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. We're now going to um, open open the screen to questions, and uh, which I'm going to moderate because they're coming into me. One that, that hasn't been uh, particularly um, uh, addressed in this is the role of India. Uh, we've had some questions in saying, keep India out and everything's going to be okay. But India is a big player. And in the bigger geopolitical sense, you now have India, Japan, Australia, and the US, and, and it, with the, the quad in Asia to sort of stop Chinese expansion. So that's all going on as well. So perhaps if I could go first to Ambassador Hakani, uh, if you're still with us, could you give us, and, and just in a minute, uh, it, it, it also encapsulate your view on what India's role should be. And then I'd like Dr. Azami to address that issue as well. Um, Ambassador Hakani. Yeah. <laughs> the concern about an Indian presence in Afghanistan is a very Pakistani perspective. The Pakistani military has persuaded many others that if India is kept out of Afghanistan, then somehow Pakistan will be amenable uh, to letting Afghanistan be. Uh, my question to all those who have that perspective is, what is India's presence in Afghanistan? It is legitimate for Pakistan to say that India should not have military bases or a military presence in Afghanistan uh, because that somehow threatens Pakistan. And that is something that Afghanistan's government and Pakistan's government could negotiate and sign an agreement about. Uh, but if the notion of an Indian presence is that in, uh, Afghans should not watch Bollywood movies, which one Pakistani general did say on record once, um, then I think that that is a psychological uh, factor which cannot be addressed by international agreements or any other uh, deal. Why shouldn't the Afghan have the sovereign right to trade with uh, India, uh, to have cultural relations with India, to send their young people to study in India? And I think that that is something that the international community will have to deal firmly with Pakistan and say, we understand that you want uh, to be secure, but security has to be uh, a rational concept, not an irrational, emotional and psychological one. So I don't think keeping India out is a solution. The other part is that India has been an economic uh, sort of partner of Afghanistan and it has been a, a major donor there. Uh, and I think that that is something uh, that uh, uh, we heard from several people. Uh, Afghanistan will continue to need. So, uh, so Pakistan is in a unique situation that Pakistan cannot provide economic assistance to Afghanistan because it is an economic uh, aid recipient itself. Uh, India can and Pakistan doesn't want that. I think that that is not the solution from the point of view of the Afghans. I think the Afghans will and should accept any Indian assistance they get. Uh, and India has been consistent in opposing the Taliban as well as Talibanization. So India has a lot more goodwill among non-Taliban Afghan factions than Pakistan does. Thank you very much. Do, uh, Dr. Asami, could you perhaps broaden that out for us into a, into a more geopolitical uh, context of India's role in Afghanistan uh, within the geopolitics of the region and globally? Mute or... Whilst we're waiting for Dr. Asami, is uh, Navid Normal, are you, are you still with us? Um, perhaps you could give the official view of your government on this uh, this sort of ongoing row over whether how much India should be involved in your country. There's one thing that I, I, I would like to I want to bring to to the attention here that uh, I, I would request that please take us off from the scope of rivalry. That's what's something that has been happening. So if, be it India, Pakistan, or be it Russia, China, uh, it, the, these rivalries basically is bringing all the tragedies. Uh, so what's important for us is that we would like to have a good relationship uh, uh, and with our neighbors as well as our regional partners. India has played an important role uh, uh, 
even before 2001 and after that, they have been uh, they have been a partner in Afghanistan with the development and uh, and, and uh, uh, they have supported us. Uh, so we are basically looking for uh, for 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 trade and economic connectivity, which I see that all these countries that we are talking about could be a part of it. So that's one of our most important priorities. Uh, definitely, uh, we do have uh, uh, good relations with India. We also would like to see good relations with other neighbors. Uh, but but one, one, one important thing is that uh, uh, we should keep in mind is that our multi-alliances uh, in, in the region does not translate uh, a threat to other regional countries, and it should not. Uh, and for that matter, uh, it's important that uh, the countries should understand that no country will be uh, uh, will be threatened from the from the soil of Afghanistan, and that's something that we have been working with and we will be working on with our partners, be it regional or international. Uh, uh, can, can I just follow up there with a with a question of mine? It's that uh, you know, there's a, we've heard a lot of stuff about these regional actors coming in. You don't want to be part of any rivalry. And we hear this a lot with other conflicts that are going on around the world. To what extent is Afghanistan's problems due to this interference from outside powers? And to what extent is it a problem within Afghanistan itself that it, uh, yeah. that it can't put together its own uh, its own government or, or whatever? Definitely, as we as we talked, uh, as one of our panelists earlier talked about, is that the conflict in Afghanistan has three dimensions. So it's, 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 it's national dimension, regional and international. We do agree that there are parts that should be played by the government of Afghanistan, but the regional actors have played significantly and they have a stake uh, and also uh, a role to play uh, for, 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 the, for, the, for the peace in Afghanistan. Uh, there's one thing that, uh, that, that, that we should keep in mind is that uh, uh, the stability and, and, and prosperity in our region uh, basically lies in a sincere cooperation within the regional countries. And we should not uh, forget that a political settlement that is leading to a peaceful Afghanistan will not only help Afghanistan, but the entire, but the entire country. So basically what I would like to say is that uh, uh, if, if we have a positive interest uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the peaceful Afghanistan, that will basically rise the trade and investment that will that will that will uh, develop our human security and we will be able to successfully fight against the threat of terrorism that is something which which not only uh, afghanistan or the regional countries are interested into but the world is interested or should be interested uh, that we will be able to successfully fight a, a menace that is that is a threat to all the humanity okay thank you for that we have a question coming in that i'd like to Put, well, it's asked for Tim Foxley, but I'd like to Antonio to also come in if you could keep your your answers very short. On it's really stringing that the links between the Taliban and other terror or insurgency groups. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of questions on this, but but it, w w with a lot of detail about the links to the Haqqani network, the Islamic State, and all the rest of it. Uh, Tim, could you give us a give us an up sum on that? I think. I think Antonio is, is massively better positioned to, 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 okay, to okay, give the detail. Good, good. Antonio, really, yeah. I mean, it's Antonio is sitting there. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, this relationship exists and deep is beyond dispute. Even the, and of course, officially the Taliban say we don't have any relation with Al-Qaeda and other groups like that. And officially, they acknowledge, you know, we have close relations. They used to be better, you know, things have, are not as good as they used to be. There have been a number of incidents recently, last year, including the killing of Asim Omar, uh, the leader of the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic subcontinent, uh, which raised suspicions within the ranks of Al-Qaeda of uh, some collaboration, intelligent collaboration between Taliban and uh, Americans, because the way it happened, you know, Omar was in Pakistan, was invited to Afghanistan. Uh, they kept him there for a meeting that didn't seem to be really necessary in, in, uh, in Musakala. And then he gets killed. So, and it was in September. So at the time when the Taliban were trying to uh, bring the negotiation with the Americans back on, back in line. So 
many in Al-Qaeda think, you know, well, whether it's Abatullah or somebody else, we can't trust the Taliban anymore because inevitably these guys are talking to the Americans, the Americans are asking for favors, they may want to do favors. So the relationship is not the same, but it's nonetheless still there. You still have a few hundred uh, Al-Qaeda members of operatives uh, in Afghanistan. Most of the days are uh, with Taliban, although usually they choose Taliban commanders who are not very close to the leadership to be on the safe side. You have uh, actually a growing number of Central Asians because many Central Asians were with the Islamic State are defecting back to Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda-like groups. So although the overall number is not growing, you know, but the, it's growing on, on the Taliban side. Um, so the Taliban have to manage this. There are different views in the Taliban about what to do with them. Some say, well, you know, uh, we can't cut off relation with these guys who sacrificed themselves for us all these years. And there are mostly military commanders saying that, you know, people who fought alongside these guys for years and years and years. And then the political leaders were trying to keep everybody happy a little bit. And they are saying, well, you know, our understanding of the deal with America is that we should get them out of Afghanistan by the end or the American withdrawal, if that happens. So we have some time. And then meanwhile, we are negotiating, talking, we're trying to find places for them where they can relocate without us having to really push them too hard. You know? So basically, we're trying to yeah, get them out, but in a soft way and gradually and little by little. Uh, and then if you are left behind, nobody will probably notice because you know they will be hidden in caves here and there. Uh, it's not so easy to relocate these guys because, of course, not many places want them. Um, but quite a few are going to Pakistan now already. They're beginning to move to Pakistan. I think that Pakistan is the. Um, it, there's some more questions coming. So if I can yeah. stop you there, Antonio, and yeah. move on. There's some questions coming in about China. So if I could go uh, first to Ambassador uh, Katak about, uh, uh, about China. And, and the question here is the opening up of. Uh, of Afghanistan to China, the Belt and Road, the base in Tajikistan, uh, that sort of thing. To what extent is this changing the balance? And and also, if there is going to be, as Tim Foxley, you know, possibly, you know, his scenarios continuing fighting for the next five or ten years, will the Chinese want to be involved in there? And if 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 they don't, what do they do about it? Ambassador, yes. Uh, let, let me say that. China has definitely been building up influence in uh, Southwest Asia and in uh, Asia. Uh, it has uh, uh, re close relationships with most of the uh, Central Asian countries. Uh, there is a special project uh, that links uh, Pakistan to China called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, even though it's not part of the main Silk Road as China envisages it, nor is it part of the uh, 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 board uh, the, the the Belt and Road Initiative, but it has been in, be, been linked. So, will China want to have uh, a, a major role in Afghanistan, uh, tapping its mineral resources, which have already been identified by the Americans? Uh, uh, yes, it will, and China will probably have it easier uh, than the Americans because, in case of the Americans, it's always private sector investment and private sector corporations want uh, assurances for both security and rate of returns that are concerns uh, that China uh, has less of. Uh, that said, I think that China and Pakistan will move in tandem in Afghanistan. Pakistan uh, on security issues, China in the economic realm. And that is something that people often tend to ignore, uh, the closeness between Pakistan and China and their uh, regional policies. Okay. Uh, Dr. Azami, I see your 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 backing. Can I just bring this over to you and, and ask a specific question? If there is going to be fighting in Afghanistan instability, and given China's um, claim that it that expands peacefully without shots being fired in anger, is it really going to want to get involved and invest a lot or be politically involved in uh, Afghanistan as much as we might be discussing? And if it is, is this essentially possibly a, a, a Cold War uh, kind of US-China uh, 
a brokerage or proxy situation or something like that. And very quickly, please, because we've got to wrap up uh, shortly. Well, uh, it uh, is uh, definitely increasing its uh, influence in the region, not only in Afghanistan, and will be more involved in Afghanistan, especially after the withdrawal of US and NATO forces, both uh, economically and politically. And uh, it will be more involved for another reason too. It's, uh, uh, relations with India are becoming more and more tense. So there'll be more competition in the region for more influence, uh, for more regional influence. So that's the second reason. And uh, earlier you asked me a question, I guess, about India, India's strategic role in the region. Uh, wait, India wait. is, you know... Okay. Very quick. Yes, please. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, is, you know, is one of the we're biggest... Time. Yeah, we're coming out of time. But carry on. Yep. Yeah. So India is uh, one of the biggest supporters of the current Afghan government. It sees uh, the Taliban as a Pakistani proxy. So it doesn't see Taliban becoming uh, uh, back to power in Afghanistan in its strategic interest. And the third reason is that uh, the US and NATO military presence gives India a security umbrella to continue its activities. India is uh, the biggest regional donor in Afghanistan has and has been involved in many reconstruction projects. And the fourth reason is that India believes that if the US and NATO forces with Afghanistan, there might be or there will be a security vacuum. And uh, groups like Al-Qaeda and Daesh, as well as those groups which are focused on fighting in Indian administered Kashmir, will increase activities and, and will pose more security challenges to India. So that's why India is supporting the continued US and NATO military presence. But on the other hand, China doesn't, China, Russia, Iran, and Pakistan are all against uh, a long-term US military presence. So there are fundamental differences between India's role and China's role, but there is one uh, factor which is, uh, which, which is kind of uh, the same for all the regional players, and that is to increase their influence in Afghanistan, whether it's Pakistan, Iran, Russia, China, and uh, India. And this competition, I guess, will increase after the US and NATO military withdrawal, unless there is a regional framework uh, that all these countries are brought together in that framework uh, where they would be able to cooperate with each other. So that is the key to bring peace to Afghanistan. Unless that happens, there'll be more chaos. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on that word chaos, I just want, before we uh, go to Barry Gardner, I'm going to repeat uh, Tim Foxley's four scenarios. And I just wondered if each of you could tell me in the one word, which one you think is going to be the most likely. Uh, the first one is an accord with the Taliban and, and, and general progress towards uh, a future. The second one is a flawed compromise. Uh, the third one is a stalemate with fragmentations of institutions and control of the country. And the fourth is a slow slide uh, towards a civil war uh, and even worse. Uh, Dr. Azami, what would you say? Uh, one, two, three or four? I mean, again, well, I uh, think it's, uh, it is rare that there is a regional consensus that uh, Dr. Azami, the it, it, country just say one, two, uh, the three, conflict four. in the country doesn't have a military solution. And this is what the US and NATO has also realized. And there is a consensus within the country that uh, the conflict uh, needs to be resolved. So this is the... Okay. Um, Ambassador okay. Hakani? I think it will be the fourth. I think that we will see a slow slide towards civil war. Okay. Uh, Navid Normal, I, I'm putting you in a difficult position, but uh, give us your your view. Oh, yes. So, uh, so we hope it's an accord that that will make the Taliban to embrace the peace and be under uh, uh, come and join the the, the, the the republic and be a part of a part of the the, the, the governance in Afghanistan. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Antonio Giustosi. Uh, I'd say an accord which will be a flawed compromise then resulting in a slide towards uh, civil war. So one, <laughs> two, and four. A one, two, and four. And yes. Tim Foxley. 
I'm going with with four or three or four, something like that, the lower That's end. Okay. That's pretty bleak. Well, let's go to uh, to Barry Gardner. Have you been called away, Barry, to a parliamentary vote in a great democracy? Or no, uh, I'm happy to, to tell you that uh, whilst we've been engaged in this fascinating discussion, actually, it's a statement on China. So it's extremely relevant to what we've been discussing. But it's the Foreign Secretary's statement on, on China that's been behind me as, as, uh, as our discussion has progressed. OK, uh, so, so carry on and, uh, and give, us, give us your view, please. on what Well, if there. this is called the great game, well, I, I was saying that after listening to everyone, I'd rather try my luck at a game of three-dimensional chess. I thought that would be simpler than what you've been describing. Um, I said, so what do we know? There are just too many players, too many teams in this game. OK, the USA and Europe may be pulling out their troops um, by, what is it, April 21. But the idea that this is going to simplify matters, I think, is probably over-optimistic, given that the Taliban are, as we've heard, in many ways a stronger military option now than at any time since 2001. And the Afghan National Security Force, I think, is unlikely to survive in its present form when the US and its allies are gone. But the civil war that many observers think is inevitable won't just be between the Taliban and the NSF. There are so many Islamist militant groups, warlords and other militias, fighting may well see an alignment of ethnic divisions, the largely Pashtun Taliban and the rest, particularly the Northern Alliance traditionally dominated by Tajiks. Uh, then there are thousands of foreign terrorist fighters looking for a purpose, looking for a salary in Afghanistan. Um, the Taliban, as we've heard, has about 60,000 of their own fighters, as well as maintaining its links to Al-Qaeda. Uh, the Taliban harbor fighters from Lashkar-e Taiba and jaish e Mohammed, who we recognize as the uh, Pakistan-based groups that carried out so many attacks against India. And both have links to Pakistan intelligence. Uh, the Taliban also hosts central Asian and Uyghur terrorist fighters. So we now need to think of the regional powers who will scramble for influence. Iran is close to the Tajiks and the Shia Islam Hazaras. Uh, Turkey tends to back the Uzbeks. Russia, India, other Central Asian countries may support the Northern Alliance. Pakistan supports the Taliban. China wants to ensure that anti-Chinese militancy doesn't spread from Afghanistan and that Uyghur Muslim militants get no support from the Taliban. So it's been building its links there. Uh, and at present, significant counter-terrorist action in Afghanistan is carried out in joint US-Afghan National Security Force operations, just as important as the physical presence then of the US and coalition forces is the international financial support for the ANSF and the Kabul government. And without that, the collapse of the Kabul government is, I would say, all but guaranteed. So the ministerial pledging conference in November 2020, later on this year, to collect funding for the years 20 to 24, is, I think, a key event, as Dr. Justosi uh, suggested. Um, so relations between Taliban and, and, and Kabul. In the past, the Taliban has seen the Afghan government as, as a puppet regime installed by the West. It's refused to, to even talk to its representatives. But some want to believe that the US-Taliban peace agreement may be softening that position. Um, both sides are indicating that preliminary negotiations on post-withdrawal politics will, will, will work. But hardline elements in the Taliban are talking of a military victory over the US. And so the apparent reconciliation with the Afghan government may just be a ploy to get US troops out before attempting to bring the government down, as Ambassador Haqqani suggested in his comments. Um, if we look at the latest interventions of all the neighboring countries, Russia, of course, retains deep connections to the country. Uh, it supported the Northern Alliance in the 90s in the Civil War. Most recently, uh, Moscow had a reconciliation with the Taliban, inviting representatives to Moscow, in part because of increasing rivalry with the US, as well as cultivating the Taliban, something which may have started actually as long as 10 years ago. And Russia has forged relationships with various power brokers and militias as proxies to use in the event of a civil war. Both the Russian government and the Taliban have denied recent reports that a Russian military intelligence unit had offered bounties to the Taliban for killing US and coalition troops in Afghanistan. Um, 
but maybe the fact that they have denied them so forcefully in all probability means that those reports were correct. Russia's pragmatic partnership with Iran in Syria has certainly made for easier collaboration in Afghanistan, where Russia and Iran perceive a common interest in getting the US troops out. Now, Pakistan, Prime Minister Imran Khan has long opposed the US military presence in Afghanistan, favoring a peace deal with the Taliban. Uh, the Pakistani military and intelligence welcome an ascendant Taliban because that means that any power sharing agreement coming as part of a peace deal would be more likely to align with Pakistan's vision of strategic depth in Afghanistan. That's a, a Pakistan friendly government in Kabul in the event of India PAC conflict. So after a rocky start to relations with President Trump cutting military aid over alleged terrorist links, Pakistan, I think, is back in favor in Washington. Uh, Pakistan did a lot to facilitate the negotiations between the Trump administration and the Taliban, and the Pakistani foreign minister was present at the signing ceremony for the second in incarnation of the peace deal in February. So Pakistani elements continue to back the Taliban. The UN monitoring team found, and I quote, it is clear that the Taliban are not struggling with respect to recruitment, funding, weapons, or ammunition. Um, so whilst there are other sources of funding, most analysts conclude that the Taliban remains well supplied, mainly because of support from Pakistan. Indeed, a report from the US Congress in May this year found that Pakistan continues to harbor the Taliban and associated militant groups in Pakistan, such as the Haqqani Network, uh, which maintains the ability to conduct attacks against Afghan interests. So India. India has been a significant supporter of the Afghan government, opposing the Taliban as a proxy of its strategic rival, Pakistan. And Pakistan, meanwhile, fears being encircled by India and an India-friendly Afghan government. So India has poured economic aid and investment into Afghanistan, not, not troops, but economic aid, uh, including in infrastructure, in energy, transport, and agriculture. And India must begin also, I think, to see China as China sees India as a rival in Afghanistan. Unlike China, India has not had a reconciliation with the Taliban and India-Pakistan proxy fighting in Afghanistan could become a serious concern. This is all at a time when India-China tensions remain extremely high, despite China's recent withdrawal from the disputed territory in the Himalayas after the clash that took place there. So China. China has big economic interests, uh, as Dr. Katak has suggested. Uh, China has a 30-year concession to mine copper, 25-year contract to develop oil feed fields. Um, this is precisely the mineral wealth that Tim Foxley spoke about as being currently under the ground. Well, it's going to very quickly come up above the ground. Um, it's four years since that freight train traveled from China to Afghanistan, opening up a new trade route by way of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan under the Belt and Road Initiative. And in mid-2019, China supported Pakistan's backing for the US Taliban peace plan as the initiative most likely to succeed. After the collapse of the first US Taliban process in June 2019, China hosted a Taliban delegation in Beijing. It participated in talks with Russia, Pakistan, and the US Special Representative Khalil Saad in, in Moscow in 2019. But I think it's probably true to say that the original emphasis on economic relations has now been overshadowed by China's security concerns in Afghanistan. China wants to ensure that anti-Chinese militancy doesn't spread from Afghanistan and that the Uyghur Muslim militants get no support from the Taliban. The Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the IMU, the Turkestan Islamic Party, TIP, it, it, it's, an, it's a, a Uyghur group, and the Pakistani and Afghan branches of the Taliban have all been linked at various times. So that doesn't mean that China will replace the US in trying to guarantee stability in Afghanistan. It's unlikely to invest anything like the efforts or the money that the US has done over the past two decades. But Beijing may have concluded that the US investment yielded actually little strategic gain and that the Taliban is likely to end up controlling at least part of Afghanistan. So I think it wants good relations with the Taliban uh, that should make it easier to influence the group in pursuit of China's security objectives. 
Iran is one of Afghanistan's most important sources of foreign aid. It's been responsible for significant investment into the country. U.S. officials and NATO commanders have alleged that Iran has attempted to undermine the Western mission in Afghanistan by providing ammunition and facilitating training camps for militants. The Iranian government denies that. The UN recently organized a meeting of the six plus two group after the Taliban seized control of much of Afghanistan in 1996. This group brought together the six neighbors of Afghanistan plus Russia and the US to discuss Afghanistan. And the recent meeting was interesting in that it brings back bilateral discussions, ironically, between Iran and the US, who have significant shared interests in Afghanistan, especially in boosting trade while suppressing heroin and Sunni extremism. So if we look at the power dynamics between Taliban and groups such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda, the Taliban hasn't renounced its allegiance to Al-Qaeda. A recent UN report said Al-Qaeda has been operating covertly in Afghanistan while still maintaining close relations with the Taliban. The UN team also reported that the senior leadership of Al-Qaeda is still present in Afghanistan, along with hundreds of armed operatives. Al-Qaeda is, and I quote, quietly gaining strength in Afghanistan while continuing to operate with the Taliban under their protection. ISIS has fared worse than Al-Qaeda. Both the Taliban and the Afghan National Security Forces have been attacking ISIS bases in Afghanistan. Its main base was almost eradicated in November last year, and a replacement base was attacked early this year. Uh, the UN team still estimates ISIS fighters' presence in Afghanistan at around 2,200. Um, Negotiations between the US and the Taliban have concluded by the signing of the agreement on the 29th of February. The terms of the agreement were for the US to draw down its forces from 13,000 to 8,600 within 135 days with uh, uh, withdrawal of its forces within 14 months, uh, to remove sanctions on Taliban members by August of this year, uh, to facilitate uh, prisoner exchanges between the Kabul government and the Taliban, and the Taliban committed not to allow members of the Taliban or other groups, including Al-Qaeda, to use Afghan soil to threaten the US or its allies, including by preventing recruiting training and fundraising for such activities, and for the Taliban to start intra-Afghan negotiations by March of this year. Now, there was a lull in violence before the agreement was signed, but since the 29th of February, the level has increased dramatically, as First Secretary Nur Mal explained, despite, that is, the release of 4,000 prisoners. The US announced in June that it had completed the troops' drawdown a month ahead of schedule. Negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government, however, weren't delivered on time. In mid-June 2020, the Taliban and Afghan government representatives said that preliminary negotiations could could begin uh, when the prisoner exchange is completed. The UK, where is that in all this? Well, the UK government supports the peace agreement, along no doubt with motherhood and apple pie, uh, saying it is important that talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government start soon to maintain momentum. I was really pleased that Tim Foxley spoke about the impact of coronavirus. The economy is expected to contract in Afghanistan by up to 4% in 2020, and the negative impact of the pandemic will far outweigh the improvements in, in weather conditions. On the immediate response to COVID-19 in Afghanistan, the UK contributes significantly to the humanitarian fund, providing 75% of its funding, which has allocated $1.5 million to the World Health Organization to implement their response plan and 27 million towards the multi-sectoral response in the country. Uh, on 20th of June, the United Nations Assistance Mission to Afghanistan released a report on attacks on healthcare facilities. Uh, UNAMA had already drawn attention to attacks in its first quarter. It then says, since then, the situation deteriorated. The Taliban continued abducting healthcare workers and attacked a pharmacy. The Afghan National Security Forces carried out deliberate acts of violence and intimidation affecting a healthcare facility, workers, and the delivery of medical supplies. And unknown gunmen perpetrated an attack on a maternity ward in a hospital in Kabul, resulting in dozens of civilian casualties. So, Formation of a government, um, well, the incumbent declared the winner. 
50.6% of the vote uh, and just avoided the runoff with uh, Abdullah Abdullah, uh, who was on about 40%. Um, after the challenge of the results, I think it was the 17th of May, uh, the impasse over the 2019 presidential elections were resolved. And under the terms of that agreement, uh, the former chief executive Abdullah was appointed head of a high council of national reconciliation with executive authority and the right to appoint half the cabinet. And this removed one important obstacle uh, to inter Afghan talks. But if you ask me about Tim Foxley's four scenarios, um, I was about to. I'm, I'm also an optimist, um, but I'm afraid I'm an optimist who can see no rational basis for his optimism. Barry, thank you. Um, so, so you're you're with the uh, with number one, the the accord. Will you sort of with the, the slide and the skepticism? I, I, one, one, three, and four. I think yes. I, <laughs> I'd like it to be one. I, <laughs> I I can't see it. Can I ask you just very very briefly um, the 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 DFID uh, Foreign Office merger? Will that impact British aid to Afghanistan? Um, I trust not. I hope not. Um, we know that um, the way in which our government is, is planning to flex the aid budget um, has already started. Um, I, I hope that we will still see the same uh, level of commitment. And uh, obviously in November, there will be a time when we see just how much ponying up uh, all the governments, the US and, and ourselves and other allies are prepared to do. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining us from wherever you are around the world and for our panelists uh, for contributing to the insightfulness of this conversation. In normal times, we would uh, we would uh, go around the room, we'd get some very nice wine and, 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 and munches and that from uh, Democracy Forum and mingle with each other. But we are in, in COVID-19 time, so we're just going to have to wave goodbye and say thank you. I'd just like to say a very special thank you to Navid Normal for being here and for handling his daughter so magnificently uh, during that interruption. Uh, thank thank you, you very much, Navid, and thank you, everybody else, and we'll just wave goodbye. <laughs>